Ancient wisdom meets modern neuroscience, empowering relational connections within organizations. Presented by First Five Santa Clara County with Dr. David Arredondo. The mission of First Five Santa Clara County is to offer parents, providers, and policymakers with the opportunity to gain important information about the healthy development of infants, young children, and their families. David Arredondo is a medical doctor, clinical psychiatrist for adults and children, forensic expert, and director of applied neuroscience. An author, expert witness, lecturer, and consultant, David's work has been featured on PBS. He has been interviewed on NPR and MSNBC. For the last several years, Dr. Arredondo has focused on the continuing innovation of culturally competent, community-based services for children. Dr. Arredondo also provides executive development services to individuals and corporations to help leaders cultivate constructive interpersonal dynamics in the corporate environment. His work has culminated in the Tanal Connectedness Initiative, in which he has translated advances in developmental neuroscience into a method to deliver child, family-friendly, and professional support services to individuals. His work carries a message of healing and hope that greatly benefits the individuals he works with. The parts of our mind we already know about, those are easy. It's the ones that are hidden, the ones that are revealed in dreams, the ones that are revealed in peculiar behaviors or actions, the ones that are revealed in free associations, uh, slips of the tongue, etc. That's the part of the mind that's more difficult to get to. Ancient Wisdom Meets Modern Neuroscience is a video podcast series that focuses on the importance of human connection. In this episode, Empowering Relational Connections Within Organizations, Dr. David Arredondo discusses the importance of human connection as it pertains to organizations that focus their services on programs that support children in their growth and development. It is our connection to our own heart, mind, body, and soul that allows us to relate to others in a healthy, co-creative environment. The workplace can also be an extraordinary place to connect with people, uh, to learn from people, to share with people, to co-create with people, to imagine what can be as opposed to what there is now. It can be the place of extraordinary creativity, extraordinary invention. We've seen the results of this, uh, and when we, when we see it, we're, we're amazed when we see what's possible when, when a group of people correctly align uh, and, with each other and with a common purpose and a common goal and they want to do it and they want to do it well and they do it because they love it and they believe in it. I'm tempted to just start with something I was going to put in the middle which is, which is a description of, of reality, a, a model of the cosmos that is very, very, very ancient, but is very, very, very accurate as far as I can tell, and more accurate than any of the models that I've seen uh, thus far, but just into the nature of how things really exist in this universe. It, the model is called, or the metaphor is called the net of Indra, and the net of Indra is a, an infinite web, like a spider's web, except instead of in two dimensions, it's in three dimensions. So you have an infinite web, the size of the cosmos, uh, with an infinite number of fibers crisscrossing in all directions. And at every intersection of every fiber, there's a diamond, a, a, a diamond with an infinite number of facets on it, or close to infinite. And when I use the word infinite, I should qualify that by saying, I'm not sure whether or not infinity exists in nature or not, but let's, for the purposes of just discussion, let's just presume that it does. At any rate, every one of these facets is polished so smooth it becomes a mirror. Now, as you, as you visualize this, and this is a, a contemplation or a meditative contemplation that's been practiced for 3,000 years, you can see how anything that happens anywhere in that network is reflected everywhere. 
and there's nothing that can happen that doesn't affect everything else. And if you think about reality, that is absolutely true. You cannot take out one molecule without the whole thing either collapsing or exploding or something. But the, the point is that we cannot, we, we cannot add or, t or subtract anything from, the, from reality as we know it without changing all of it. And that may sound very esoteric and like, what, the, what does that have to do with work or family or helping other people? But I think it will become clear. I hope it becomes clear as we move on. Now, all of us have this three pound piece of meat sitting in our cranium, okay? In a, a newborn and a an, um, young toddler, there are 150 billion nerve cells, billion nerve cells in this organ of the body. It's an organ just like any other organ. Those 150 billion make between 10,000 and 100,000 connections with the other cells in the brain, which means that the number of potential co connections in a child's brain is of the same order of magnitude as, as the number of atoms in the known cosmos. Atoms in the known cosmos. That's the order of magnitude. So that makes each child's brain and your brain the most complex thing by far in the cosmos. Your brain and your mind by far are the most complex things that exist or that have ever existed. And you could take all the computers that have ever been made multiply them by a million, put them all in series, and put them all in parallel, and they wouldn't come close to one human brain. And there are things that you can do with your brain that no computer can do. But let me talk, talk to you about the different parts of the brain, because what I want to talk to you, the crux of what I want to talk to you about today is something called the tonal. And the tonal is the heart, the mind, the body, and the soul of a human. And that tonal, which is an ancient, Mesoamerican, in other words, it comes from this hemisphere, de aquí, it comes from here, not from Europe and not from Asia, but from ancient uh, Western hemispheric sources, a model emerged of the entirety of the human being, which included the heart, mind, body, and soul. And what we know now is that these things correspond to different parts of the brain. The mind is entirely right here in the frontal cortex, this part of the brain that sits on the top, okay? That is the mind of the human. Without this, there is no mind. Now, we have an extraordinary number of emotions, extraordinary human emotions, I think you'll agree, shame, sadness, disgust, contempt, astonishment, enjoyment, frustration, fear, guilt, delight, joy, lust, envy, jealousy, affection. These are incredible human emotions, are they not? Those emotions, as exquisite as they can be and as nuanced as they can be, we share with our evolutionary ancestors. And the reason it matters is because we know now that that part of the brain is right here. It's called the limbic midbrain. It's the center part of the brain. This part of the brain is much older than this cortex. Now your dog can't, I don't think your dog can do math, or m much math, or read poetry, or write music, or do uh, abstract thinking. All of that occurs in the cortex. That's the mind. The emotions, the, the other things, the feelings of sometimes feelings of shame, feelings of anger, things like that, those occur from the midbrain, and we share that with the animal kingdom. All right? So now, so we have two parts of the brain. We have the mind and we have the emotional center. And in the model of the tonal, that's called basically the mind and the heart. The heart is the center of the feelings. So we have the mind and the heart. Now we know from medicine and from science, we also have a genetic endowment. We have uh, DNA and that determines a lot of our temperament, our eye color, are, are some of uh, the uh, diseases that we're vulnerable to or not vulnerable to, what height we're going to be, what are, what, you know, there's a lot of things that are determined genetically. That is our body. And then there is the issue of what, what I'm going to call soul. 
or spirit or alma or purpose or greater meaning. You can attach any word you want to it. For some people, for spiritual people, it would be spirit. For other people, it would just be soulfulness, you know, putting your soul, heart and soul into something. For other people, it would be, you know, being really engaged in their work or in their art or in their craft. You know, it does, that the point is, is that it's an overarching purpose outside of the self. All right, okay, so everybody has a heart, mind, body, and soul, all right? Every one of you. Now, the trick is, how many of us can honestly say that our heart is 100% lined up with our mind, which is 100% lined up with our body, which is 100% lined up with our soul? Maybe Jesus could. But the point is this, is most of us live our lives with our heart pointing one way and our mind pointing the other way, or kind of crisscrossing, and our body doing God knows what. But the greater purpose also has to be aligned. So what we, what, one of the things that we need to do individually, before we can talk about it organizationally, individually we have to be clear, are we aligned internally? Is our heart in line with our mind? Is it in line with our uh, purpose? And are we doing the things that we need to do? And so the first thing to ask yourself tonight when you go home, hopefully, is to think, well, wh wait a minute, how aligned am I really? Am I really living the life that, that, that uh, I think I should be living? Am I really living the life that I feel I should be living? Am I, is my life really aligned with what I call my purpose in life? Or do I, are my priorities a little off? Or, am I, or is this off or is that off? Because to the extent that we can bring those things in alignment, we can also create the circumstances that are necessary for happiness and that are essential for creativity and productivity. Any organization is going to benefit from an alignment between their executive function or their, their uh, strategies as thought out, being aligned with the, the, the wishes, the desires, the, the heart of their workforce. And uh, to have that also aligned with the understanding and the desires of the board uh, it's going to create a more effective, more efficient, and more productive, and more sustainable, healthier organization. If your employees don't believe in your executive uh, executives, that's not a good thing. And if the board doesn't believe in your CEO, or your uh, shareholders don't believe in the board or the CEO, that's obviously going to create problems. So. The alignment of, of thought with, um, with purpose and then with the structure of the body of the organization is absolutely essential for a, a growing, healthy, creative organization. And this creativity is not just an add-on because you need creativity to solve problems and problems arise in any organization. The internal alignment of an organization and then its ex external alignment with its customers or its clients is critical and uh, highly beneficial to think about consciously. Now we're going to move to another concept called attunement. Now attunement is that harmonization with another person or with an organization or with the world. It is that, that alignment of yourself with something greater than yourself. Now it occurs naturally. How many of you have had infant children? Okay, so you know when they're little bitty and you play peekaboo, you know, or coochie coochie coochie, and they, they are immediately like responsive, you know, and their, their faces light up and your faces light up, right? And that's, you're not trying. Are you trying? Are they trying? No. But you are attuned. You are connected. You are reciprocally connected. And you're reciprocally connected in a way that is causing their brain to change and actually your brain and your chemicals to change. Is that attunement with another is one of the core joys of this human life. And someone might say one of the core purposes of it because we're only here for a very, very short time. The point here is now that 
Humans require connection. That connection has to be reciprocal. That capacity for connection varies from human to human. That can be connect, uh, cultivated. That also depends on internal alignment, and internal alignment needs external connection to nourish it. Okay? Now we're going to move to another concept called attunement. Now, attunement is that harmonization with another person or with an organization or with the world. It is that, that alignment of yourself with something greater than yourself. And my favorite example was, uh, favorite example because it's easy to illustrate, is uh, I was uh, uh, watching some symphony cellists play, a very, very difficult piece. And they're playing, there's four of them in a line, and it's getting more and more and more difficult. The music is absolutely gorgeous. And they're moving, you know how they move in alignment when the strings play? And you see these masters, I mean, these are world-class cellists playing. And they're, they're so focused, they are so aligned internally. I mean, their heart, mind, body, and soul is totally there, and they're totally in the present, and they're totally doing what they were designed and have worked all their lives to do. And they are playing the cello just, there's no self there, okay? And, and they're playing, and the music is building up and building up and building up. And I was close, sitting close enough to where I could see them, and I saw one of them just turn to the left, and the, and the one to his left, like almost telepathically, turn to the right at the same time, and you could just see that this, this little, the slightest little grin, and it was like, ah, this is what we live for. This is it. And, and, and if you could feel that music and see what they were doing and see the, the joy of, the, of doing something that they were totally present for in that moment, that attunement that they had with each other and that they both had with the music and that the music had on, on the audience and the way that that was working, that's a model that I like to use because that is true also for athletes. It's true for managers. It's true for therapists. It's true for anybody that's doing what they should be doing. And you know when that's true. And so the, the point is that when we're looking for purpose, when we're looking for meaning, which we have to have, we must also learn to recognize what this attunement is. Let's talk about in an organization, how would this map on an organization? Well, an organization has a heart, hopefully. It has an ethos, it has an atmosphere, it has a feeling about it. It could be like one of these ruthless, you know, you know, aggressive, like we're just gonna rip the competition to shreds and you know, we're a bunch of software geeks and we can't wait to just like, Arr! we're just gonna tear them apart. Or it can be a loving, kind, you know, service organization that says, listen, we're trying to help people that need help. We're trying to educate people that need educating. We're trying to provide food or we're trying to provide uh, information or education to people that need it. We can, there's, or, or it can be a sports team that is like, uh, you know, there's a whole range. But the point is that there is a heart. And there is a head, there is a mind, too, because there's a thought to the structure of it. And there has to be thought paid to the infrastructure the organizational infrastructure and the structure of a place to, to whether or not certain other things can happen, such as creativity and growth. Now here, you're blessed with this beautiful space that's designed for teaching, looks like. Designed for people to, to learn and come in and exchange ideas and so on and so forth. Not all organizations have that. So, so that when we talk about the body, or we use this as a rough analogy, we're referring to those aspects of organizational and physical architecture that have to do, and psychological architecture. Is it a rigid hierarchy or is it, is it more fluid? And the point is, is that with different structures you get different results. And then there's the overarching mission. And I'm going to describe a model, although it's not neurobiologically, precise. It is a, a, a very good metaphor. We have to speak in metaphor, and usually they're visual metaphors because our brains think that way. That's why we dream visually so much. A visual symbol can, can give you so much more information than words, which are oftentimes limited and limiting. Okay? 
So I'm going to give you a, a model right now. The mind learns in no small measure, at perhaps primarily visually. And that one of the interesting things I discovered in reviewing the literature on creativity is that there are some people who believe that everything has to be translated into visual terms before it can be presented. And they talk about, say, for example, the discoveries of Einstein, relativity. You know, that was a visual image, you know, the trains and the clocks and stuff like that. Or if you ask, uh, for example, Picasso, he says, well, I don't create anything, I just discover. Or if you ask Michelangelo, he says, well, I don't, I don't you know, go to a piece of rock and try and find a, sculpt something out of it. I, I discover the sculpture that's inside the rock. And so some people would argue that there's really no such thing as creativity. There's only discovery. But the point is, is that we, in this context, is that this is often a visual process. Now I'm going to give you another visual model, and that's of how the mind actually works. And so what I want you to do is I want you to imagine a cookie sheet. You know, cookie tray? About this deep. And then a color covered in jello that is about three quarters of the way done, or four fifths of the way done. Or in mud that's pretty pasty. And then you're going to, we're going to take this cookie sheet, we're going to lift it up about six inches, you know, five inches, one edge up off the edge of the table. So it's at a slant. And then at the very top, we're going to take an eyedropper and we're going to drop drops randomly towards the top and you let them run down. Now, the first drop you drop just kind of goes down. Second drop, same thing. Third, kind of weaves its way down. Fourth, same thing. Fifth, more or less the same thing. The sixth drop, though, kind of merges in with that third drop and goes down the same path. And then the seventh does the same thing, but maybe with another uh, rivulet. And so on and so forth until basically what you end up with is this finite number of rivulets. And every drop you drop ends up going down the same pathway, one of those pathways. And that's how our minds work most of the time. Most of the times our mind works like that. And so that's called conditioned thinking. We've learned to approach a problem in a certain way, and so we approach all problems in that way. So this is what happens with our mind. We have a certain number of ideas, a certain number of boxes that we put things into, and a certain way of judging things and people, and we, we judge them by, by a certain set of criteria. You know, we judge them maybe by their address, or by their car, or by what part of town they live in, or how dark they are, or you know, any number of things. We judge people, and we decide we like them or we don't like them. And the same thing's true with ideas. You know, that's a good idea, that's a bad idea, that's a stupid idea. You know, if you can't make money on it, why even bother thinking about it? You know, that kind of thinking occurs a, a lot. I mean, wh why are we even doing this? There's no profit margin in it. That is a, not an uncommon filter in a free market economy. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying it exists. Ignorance itself is an interesting subject. There are three kinds of ignorance. The first is not knowing something. You don't know the population of Dayton, Ohio. The second is not knowing something and not knowing that you don't know it. Okay? And then the third is not knowing something and thinking you do. And it's useful to clarify what kind of ignorance you're dealing with when you're dealing with someone and you're dealing with a problem because far, 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 far more harm is done in this world out of ignorance than out of malevolence. It is ignorance that causes most of our problems, not bad badness. Okay? And if people knew better, they'd do better. And so just keep that in mind. And you'll be less judgmental towards yourself, which means you'll be less judgmental towards others, which means you'll be able to see more clearly. Now, I want you to picture this, what's happening right now, Okay, you're looking, at the, you're looking at me right now. There's cameras over here, this and that. I want you to imagine the same scene, but I want you to imagine it from that corner. You see something different. Imagine it from across the street. Imagine it from the top of Hoyt Tower in San Francisco. Imagine it from the furthest reaches of the Milky Way. Imagine it from the floor. 
at any rate, the point is, is that your mind can actually move from the, to these different perspectives. And these different perspectives are useful in shaking you loose from those rivulets that you've set up. And that's foundational, that's critical for problem solving creatively. So that's point of view. But where it really comes in handy is when you're working with other people in negotiation or in whatever other interaction. Because if you take the time and do it consciously, and, and therapists need to do, have to do this as a matter of their profession because they have to, they have to be empathic. They have to take what's called a, a, an empathic stance, which is a technical term for seeing the world to the eyes of someone else. I think what is meant by the empathic stance and how important it is to just be there sometimes. It doesn't have to be talking all the time. You don't have to be doing something. You don't have to be asking questions. You don't have to be doing activities or whatever. Just being there sometimes with someone. But looking at the world through their eyes or sharing looking at the world together, that empathic stance, that looking through the eyes of someone else is POV. And in business, the capacity to look at a situation from the point of view of your coworker, or the point of view of your competitor, or the co point of view of your customer, or the point of view of your board, or the point of view of the regulatory agency, all of these, and to look at these systematically is a very powerful way to get the kind of comprehensiveness that you need. Here we get to another thing that the ancients teach us about approaching things from multiple points of view, and from it's called a network of loci practice where you would look at things from different vantages. Uh, look at it from the top, look at it from the bottom, look at it from the point of view of the rich, look at it from the point of view of the poor, look at it from, from some, someone in the middle, look at it from the point of view of your adversary. This is the fundamentals of the art of war, for example, or the art of, uh, of negotiations or diplomacy. The point is that you, we can be more comprehensive in several ways. One of those ways is to look at these uh, interactions, internal and ex external, in the context of the mind or thought, the heart or feelings or emotions, the body in terms of the infrastructure and the in, innately wired constraints on what can be done and not done, and what is the natural impulse and what is not the natural impulse, and finally, what is the overarching goal? What is the overarching purpose? What is the rationale? What are we doing here and why are we doing it? First Five Santa Clara County is dedicated to providing learning opportunities for all sectors of the community. It is important to convey what science and research tell us about how to raise happy, healthy, and productive children. We are honored to work with Dr. David Arredondo. It is our hope that his message will connect with parents, community members, and service providers so all children have an opportunity to reach their full potential. If you're interested in learning more about the work of Dr. David Arredondo, please go to his website, www.davidarredondo.com. And for more information about future podcasts and First Five Santa Clara County, please visit www.first5, that's the number five, kids.org. Thank you.